Congratulations to Tony Oliva and Jim Cott on finally getting enshrined into the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. It's been a long time coming for both of these guys, both of them going in as Minnesota Twins. They will be the fifth and sixth players to represent the Minnesota Twins in Cooperstown. Uh, Both these guys, 83 years old. So just a, a blessing that this happens while they're still with us. And maybe it'll be all the more sweeter since it, it, it was such a long wait for both of them. What's up? It's Tom Froming. We're going to talk about these guys. I was not uh, able to watch them. I'm too young to have watched them. So if you are somebody who watched these guys play, you know, definitely encourage you to share some thoughts and some feelings and reactions on this news in the comments. I know the ball players take a lot of pride, but in order to work hard, you have to work smart. You know, I was so proud yesterday when that phone rang. I was there, the phone rang, I said, oh, I alive, you know, I guess I guess I'll say, I guess I'll say to the people, that was a big relief. And I think it's very interesting, you know, obviously there's the Twins connection here, uh, so that's clearly why Twins Channel would be talking about this stuff, but two very interesting conversations to have in regard to the Hall of Fame, because they were sort of on opposite ends of the spectrum here. We have Tony Oliva, who had the... Uh, short but brilliant peak of his career and Jim Cott who had the longevity with where maybe there weren't the peaks there weren't the high points but just pitched forever and you know Tony Oliva one of the best rookie players really in baseball history just an insane rookie season in 1964 and there's sort of two big reasons why he didn't have the longevity that were both really out of his control for the most most part as you can see here this was his age 25 season in which he was a rookie in 1964 and won that rookie of the year. Uh, so he didn't come to the U.S. until his you know early 20s, um, when a lot of other guys would have been making their their debuts and or maybe even have played a couple of years. Um, so you know coming over from Cuba, he kind of had early years of his career taken away that weren't you know other players who maybe who would have been been born in the states at this time would have gotten in earlier. And then at the end of his career, you can see he kind of misses most of 1972, almost all of 1972, and then kind of isn't the same guy. He had knee injuries that he just never fully recovered from. Uh, But in between this peak here from 1964 to 1971, he was an all-star literally every single year in that stretch. So just an incredibly consistent player during that peak. And again, you can see, You know, the marquee thing, a three-time batting champ, uh, Tony Oliva was with the Twins. He led the league in hits five different times. Um, And something that I don't know that I I appreciated as much was he he hit for more power than it seems because this was a very uh, kind of a dead ball era for the most part. We'll get to that in a second. In addition to being an all-star, also got MVP votes every single year that eight-run stretch. Was the MVP runner-up in 65 to his teammate Zoilo Versailles. And uh, then in 1970, the MVP runner-up again that year to Boog Powell. So, you know, a sliver away <laughs> from becoming an MVP. Probably should have won it in 1965. but And, you know, the Hall of Fame voting... He did stick on the ballot all 15 years, but didn't get a ton of consideration. He maxed out at 47.3%, so was never really all that close to the 75% threshold. Um, Unfortunately, all those years on on the ballot. But again, just so happy to see him make it in. I do think he's deserving. You know, a lot of small hall people will probably take some issue with this because he did have such a a brief kind of run on the top. But it it was excellent. Let's switch gears here to fan graphs and let's take a look a little bit more into that peak of his from 1964 to 1971 again. And sorting this out uh, by fan graphs war, you know, I know war obviously wasn't a thing back then as a stat, but um, it works. It still works uh, when you go back because uh, it's based off of league averages and things like that. Uh, so leave over the stretch was the 12th best player in baseball, position player in baseball line, Harmon Killebrew. Uh, pretty crazy that he's up there that high. And then in terms of batting average, so if you want to kind of take some context, uh, some of the time stats, tied for fourth with Pete Rose and Manny Sanguian uh, for with a 313 batting average during that stretch. So one of the best hitters in baseball. And I mentioned the power. Again, that's not a guy that you – this isn't a guy you hear a lot about power with. It's more of the batting championships, the, the hitting ability. 
but again, this wasn't really a, a time period of a lot of power hitting. And so Tony Leva 11th or tied for 10th, really, with a 507 slugging percentage in that uh, peak period. So this is a guy who he wasn't just a, a, a batting average guy, slap hitter. This was a guy who could hit for power. And then still at Fangraphs, so let's take a look at his overall career numbers. Oliva, a guy who ended his career with a batting average over 300, which is obviously very rare, impressive. Uh, what I've got this slimmed down to is from 1936 on. I basically just picked that date because that's when the Hall of Fame actually opened. And baseball stats get kind of crazy if you include like the late 1800s, early 1900s and things like that. And then put this at a minimum of 5,000 plate appearances. Oliva had over 6,000. And was what you can see here is that Tony Oliva, his 304 batting average, was the 39th highest. And this is a sample of 740 players included in this that qualify. And again, Tony Oliva, 39th. And again, if you're like me and you didn't get a chance, you weren't around to see Tony Oliva play, some of these names along this you know list are very impressive. Again, you know, Joe Maurer, Paul Molitor, guys, Twins fans are going to know. But now they call me Hall of Fame. It's nice. It's nice <laughs> to be in this group. Jim Cott, on the other hand, sort of a completely different story. This is a guy who played 25 seasons in the major leagues. Absolutely insane. Probably the thing he's most known for is the 16 gold gloves. I believe that's now second to Greg Maddox for most all time. Um, and over that you know long career, as you see here, Cott was only a three-time All-Star. So not a guy who had those you know huge peaks or a really long... Well, we're going to talk about his peak with the Twins in just a sec here. Uh, you know, it was overwhelming when I got the call from uh, Jane Clark. I really kind of had the Hall of Fame in my rearview mirror, but uh, I, I'm I'm humbled and I'm grateful. I wasn't dominant. I was durable and dependable. I was your number two guy or number three guy, but I'm grateful to the committee that they, uh, they chose to reward uh, some durability. But just scrolling through here on baseball reference, you know, caught from 1965 to 1968 was – Uh, Just a a tremendous period for him um, in terms of uh, pitching with the Twins. And, you know, he had some really great years with the White Sox even after he left Minnesota. Um, And, and again, just stuck around forever, 25 years. Just incredible, uh, the longevity of his career. Uh, But taking a look at his um, Hall of Fame numbers, he actually didn't even come. It's a long page when you have this many uh, years to scroll down through. Um, but, you know, we talked about how uh, Oliva didn't even get to 50%. Um, Jim Cott topped out at, looks like, 29.6%. Again, 75% is what you needed to get voted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, so he did stick on the ballot for all those years, 15 years, but never really came close to getting uh, inducted. But he does, uh, selected by this Veterans Committee, uh, get in. Switching back to fan graphs here, and for Jim Cott, I wanted to take a look at, you know, since this is a Twins-focused channel, we're going to take a look at his best years with the Twins, which were from 1962 to 1972, uh, you know, a bigger slice than with uh, Oliva. But you can see over this time frame, 169 wins over this time period, second, or excuse me, third behind only Juan Marichal and Bob Gibson, a couple Hall of Famers. Uh, So that really looks good for Jim Cott. But even with the sort of advanced newer age stuff, Jim Cott is still fourth in war among this sample. Now he's quite a bit behind Bob Gibson, who just absolutely dominates in this era. But Juan Marichal, Gaylord Perry, those are the only three guys above him, all Hall of Famers. So um, you can see Cott was, you know, he's maybe a little bit more of an accumulator, a guy who was racking up numbers just from, you know, being healthy and making starts and things like that. Uh, but this this really paints him in a really good light as being much more deserving of the Hall of Fame than he got credit for. Uh, just to illustrate this insane point about Jim Cott and how much he pitched, innings pitched for everybody in the entire history of Major League Baseball, Jim Cott is 26th. That is amazing. He threw 4,500 innings. Uh, just incredible. And if we uh, take that down to game starts, uh, he's even higher up, I believe. Yeah, 17th. Jim Cott started 625 games over his career. Only 16 pitchers in the history of baseball. You got guys like Pud Galvin you know, <laughs> and Cy Young in here and Walter Johnson, all these guys from the late 1800s and early 1900s, and then Jim Cott and some other guys who 
somehow found a way to pitch 20 plus seasons. So the, the added happiness I have in addition to a lot of the other men going in the hall of fame is I get to share it with my teammate, Tony Oliva for us, Minnesota twins. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a great summer and I'm truly grateful. So very happy to see them both going in relieved that they're both able to enjoy this, that they're still around to enjoy this uh, better late than never, but it is it is kind of silly how this all works. I guess on on the positive side, you you can feel like the Hall of Fame eventually gets things right. But the fact that they it was twelve people out of a sixteen person committee that decided this they one less vote for each of these guys and they're not Hall of Famers, which is what happened to Dick Allen. He was one he was on the he was another guy under consideration. He was one vote shy. Um, so you're telling me, you know, eleven out of this sixteen thought he was in and he doesn't get in. It's just, and they, they have limits on how many vote, people they can vote for. I get that. You don't want to let everybody in, but my thing is look at, look at these guys and the joy that it's bringing them, the joy that it's bringing their families measure that against like, are we hurting Babe Ruth's legacy by letting these guys in? Are we hurting Ted Williams, Willie Mays? You know, are we hurting Randy Johnson's legacy for letting these guys into the Hall of Fame? I don't think so. The amount of joy that this is bringing to have these guys get in totally outweighs keeping guys out. And it doesn't hurt anybody who's already in (laughs) to to let these guys into the Hall of Fame. So that's my stance on it. Obviously, we're a little, uh, you know, slanted because we're Twins fans. We're going to be a little more uh, happy about these guys going in and uh, accepting of this big hall. Uh, but it, that, that is maybe some of the legacy of these guys and some of the analysis that's going to be around these guys getting in is that they're both very unique circumstances. And Oliva having this great, great peak, but it was kind of shorter than it needed to be. And then Cot having this amazing longevity, but without really maybe the highest of Cy Young awards and things like that uh, with not being there. So interesting cases, really enjoy Again, I would I would love to see your kind of takes, your memories, your your stances. Uh, I'm sure half of the people listening to this have a photo of Tony Oliva. I think he leads the the universe in photos with fans. He's such a guy who's uh, so generous with his time. Uh, so again, that just you know warms your heart to see him go to the Hall of Fame. So thanks for checking this out. We'll talk again soon.